salmon. Salmon is the common name for several species of ray finned fish in the family Salmonidae. Other fish in the same family include trout, char, grayling, and whitefish. Salmon are native to tributaries of the North Atlantic, genus Salmo, and Pacific Ocean, genus Oncorhynchus. Many species of salmon have been introduced into non native environments such as the Great Lakes of North America and Patagonia in South America. Salmon are intensively farmed in many parts of the world. Typically, Salmon are anadromous, they hatch in fresh water, migrate to the ocean, then return to fresh water to reproduce. However, populations of several species are restricted to fresh water through their lives. Folklore has it that the fish return to the exact spot where they hatch at spawn. Tracking studies have shown this to be mostly true. A portion of a returning salmon run may stray and spawn in different freshwater systems, the percent of straying depends on the species of salmon. Homing behavior has been shown to depend on olfactory memory. Salmon date back to the Neogene. The term salmon comes from the Latin salmo, which in turn might have originated from salire, meaning to leap. The nine commercially important species of salmon occur in two genera. The genus Salmo contains the Atlantic salmon, found in the North Atlantic, as well as many species commonly named trout. The genus Oncorhynchus contains eight species which occur naturally only in the North Pacific. As a group, these are known as Pacific salmon. Chinook salmon have been introduced in New Zealand and Patagonia. Coho, freshwater sockeye, and Atlantic salmon have been established in Patagonia, as well. Also, a number of other species have common names which refer to them as being salmon. Of those listed below, the Danube salmon or Hutchin is a large freshwater salmonid related to the salmon above, but others are marine fishes of the unrelated Perciformes order. Eosalmo driftwoodensis. The oldest known salmon in the fossil record, helps scientists figure how the different species of salmon diverge from a common ancestor. The British Columbia salmon fossil provides evidence that the divergence between Pacific and Atlantic salmon had not yet occurred 40 million years ago. Both the fossil record and analysis of mitochondrial DNA suggest the divergence occurred by 10 to 20 million years ago. This independent evidence from DNA analysis in the fossil record rejects the glacial theory of salmon divergence. Salmon eggs are laid in freshwater streams typically at high latitudes. The eggs hatch into 11 or sac fry. The fry quickly develop into par with camouflaging vertical stripes. The par stay for 6 months to 3 years in their natal stream before becoming smolts, which are distinguished by their bright, silvery color with scales that are easily rubbed off. Only 10% of all salmon eggs are estimated to survive to this stage. The smolt body chemistry changes, allowing them to live in salt water. While a few species of salmon remain in fresh water throughout their life cycle, the majority are anadromous and migrate to the ocean for maturation. In these species, smolts spend a portion of their outmigration time in brackish water, where their body chemistry becomes accustomed to osmoregulation in the ocean. The salmon spend about one to five years, depending on the species, in the open ocean, where they gradually become sexually mature. The adult salmon then return primarily to their natal streams to spawn. Atlantic salmon spend between one and four years at sea. When a fish returns after just one year sea feeding, it is called the grills in Canada, Britain, and Ireland. Grills may be present at spawning, and go unnoticed by large males, releasing their own sperm on the eggs. Prior to spawning, depending on the species, salmon undergo changes. They may grow a hump, develop canine like teeth, or develop a kipe, a pronounced curvature of the jaws in male salmon. All change from the silvery blue of a fresh run fish from the sea to a darker color. Salmon can make amazing journeys, sometimes moving hundreds of miles upstream against strong currents and rapids to reproduce. Chinook and sockeye salmon from central Idaho, for example, travel over and climb nearly from the Pacific Ocean as they return to spawn. Condition tends to deteriorate the longer the fish remain in fresh water, and they then deteriorate further after they spawn, when they are known as Celts. In all species of Pacific salmon, the mature individuals die within a few days or weeks of spawning, a trait known as smell parity. Between 2 and 4 percent of Atlantic salmon kelps survive to spawn again, all females. However, even in those species of salmon that may survive to spawn more than once, iteroparity, post-spawning mortality is quite high, perhaps as high as 40 to 50 percent. Delay hero, the female salmon uses her tail, caudal fin, to create a low-pressure zone, lifting gravel to be swept downstream, excavating a shallow depression, called a red. The red may sometimes contain 5,000 eggs covering. 
the eggs usually range from orange to red. One or more males approach the female in hair red, depositing sperm, or milt, over the row. The female then covers the eggs by disturbing the gravel at the upstream edge of the depression before moving on to make another red. The female may make as many as seven reds before her supply of eggs is exhausted. Each year, the fish experiences a period of rapid growth, often in summer, and one of slower growth, normally in winter. This results in ring formation around a near bone called the otolith, annuli, analogous to the growth rings visible in a tree trunk. Freshwater growth shows as densely crowded rings. Sea growth is widely spaced rings, spawning is marked by significant erosion as body mass is converted into eggs and milk. Freshwater streams and estuaries provide important habitat for many salmon species. They feed on terrestrial and aquatic insects, amphipods, and other crustaceans while young, and primarily on other fish when older. Eggs are laid in deeper water with larger gravel, and need cool water and good water flow, to supply oxygen, to the developing embryos. Mortality of salmon in the early life stages is usually high due to natural predation and human-induced changes in habitat, such as siltation, high water temperatures, low oxygen concentration, loss of stream cover, and reductions in river flow. Estuaries and their associated wetlands provide vital nursery areas for the salmon prior to their departure to the open ocean. Wetlands not only help buffer the estuary from silt and pollutants, but also provide important feeding and hiding areas. Salmon not killed by other means show greatly accelerated deterioration, phenoptosis, or programmed aging, at the end of their lives. Their bodies rapidly deteriorate right after they spawn as a result of the release of massive amounts of corticosteroids. In the Pacific Northwest and Alaska, salmon are keystone species, supporting wildlife such as birds, bears, and otters. The bodies of salmon represent a transfer of nutrients from the ocean, rich in nitrogen, sulfur, carbon, and phosphorus to the forest ecosystem. Grizzly bears function as ecosystem engineers, capturing salmon and carrying them into adjacent wooded areas. There they deposit nutrient-rich urine amphses and partially eaten carcasses. Bears are estimated to leave up to half the salmon they harvest on the forest floor, in densities that can reach 4,000 kg per hectare, providing as much as 24% of the total nitrogen available to the riparian woodlands. The foliage of spruce trees up to from a stream where grizzlies fish salmon have been found to contain nitrogen originating from fished salmon. Beavers also function as ecosystem engineers. In the process of clear cutting and damming, beavers alter their ecosystems extensively. Beaver ponds can provide critical habitat for juvenile salmon. An example of this was seen in the years following 1818 in the Columbia River Basin. In 1818, the British government made an agreement with the U.S. government to allow U.S. citizens access to the Columbia Catchment, Sea Treaty of 1818. At the time, the Hudson's Bay Company sent word to trappers to extirpate all fur bearers from the area in an effort to make the area less attractive to U.S. fur traders. In response to the elimination of beavers from large parts of the river system, salmon runs plummeted, even in the absence of many of the factors usually associated with the demise of salmon runs. Salmon recruitment can be affected by beavers' dams because dams can. Beavers' dams are able to nurture salmon juveniles in estuarine tidal marshes where the salinity is less than 10 parts per million. Beavers build small dams of generally less than high in channels in the myrtle zone. These dams can be overtopped at high tide and hold water at low tide. This provides refuges for juvenile salmon so they do not have to swim into large channels where they are subject to predation. It has been discovered that rivers which have seen a decline or disappearance of anadromous lampreys, loss of the lampreys also affects the salmon in a negative way. Like salmon, anadromous lampreys stop feeding and die after spawning, and their decomposing bodies release nutrients into the stream. Also, along with species like steelhead reds and Sacramento sucker, lampreys clean the gravel in the rivers during spawning. Their larvae, called amokoites, are filter feeders which contribute to the health of the waters. They are also a food source for the young salmon, and being fattier and oilier, it is assumed predators prefer them over salmon offspring, taking off some of the predation pressure on smolts. Adult lampreys are also the preferred prey of seals and sea lions, which can eat 30 lampreys to every salmon, allowing more adult salmon to enter the river stow spawn without being eaten by the marine mammals. According to Canadian biologist Dorothy Kieser, the mixozoan parasite Hengaya salmonicola is commonly found in the flesh of salmon. It's it has been recorded in the field samples of salmon returning to the Haida Gwaii Islands. 
The fish responds by walling off the parasitic infection into a number of cysts that contain milky fluid. This fluid is an accumulation of a large number of parasites. Henga and other parasites in the Myxosporian group have complex life cycles, where the salmon is one of two hosts. The fish releases the spores after spawning. In the Hengaya case, the spores enter a second host, most likely an invertebrate, in the spawning stream. When juvenile salmon migrate to the Pacific Ocean, the second host releases a stage infective to salmon. The parasite is then carried in the salmon until 10x spawning cycle. The Myxosporian parasite that causes whirling disease in trout has a similar life cycle. However, as opposed to whirling disease, the Hengaya infestation does not appear to cause disease in the host salmon, even heavily infected fish tend to return to spawn successfully. According to Dr. Kieser, a lot of work on Hengaya salmonicola was done by scientists at the Pacific Biological Station in Nanaimo in the mid-1980s, in particular, an overview report which states, the fish that have the longest freshwater residence time as juveniles have the most noticeable infections. Hence, in order of prevalence, coho are most infected, followed by sockeye, chinook, chum, and pink. As well, the report says, at the time the studies were conducted, stocks from the middle and upper reaches of large river systems in British Columbia, such as Fraser, Skeena, Nas, and from mainland coastal streams in the southern half of BC, are more likely to have a low prevalence of infection. The report also states, it should be stressed that Hengaya, economically deleterious though it is, is harmless from the view of public health. It is strictly a fish parasite that cannot live in or affect warm-blooded animals, including man. According to Klaus Schally, mollusk and shellfish program specialist with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, Hengaya salmonicola is found in southern Sea. Also and in all species of salmon. I have previously examined smoked chum salmon sides that were riddled with cysts and some sock irons in Barclay Sound, southern BC, west coast of Vancouver Island, are noted for their high incidence of infestation. Sea lice, particularly Lepiotheris salmonis and various Caligus species, including C. clemency and C. roger cressi, can cause deadly infestations off both farm-grown and wild salmon. Sea lice are ectoparasites which feed on mucus, blood, and skin and migrate and latch onto the skin of wild salmon during free swimming, planktonic nauplii and copepidid larval stages, which can persist for several days. Large numbers of highly populated, open-net salmon farms can create exceptionally large concentrations of sea lice, when exposed in river estuaries containing large numbers of open-net farms, many young wild salmon are infected, and do not survive as a result. Adult salmon may survive otherwise critical numbers of sea lice, but small, Thin-skinned juvenile salmon migrating to sea are highly vulnerable. On the Pacific coast of Canada, the louse-induced mortality of pink salmon in some regions is commonly over 80%. The risk of injury caused by underwater pile driving has been studied by Dr. Halverson and her co-workers. The study concluded that the fish are at risk of injury if the cumulative sound exposure level exceeds 210 decibels relative to 1 pa s. As can be seen from the production chart at the left. The global capture reported by different countries to the FAO of commercial wild salmon has remained fairly steady since 1990 at about 1 million tons per year. This is in contrast to farmed salmon, below, which has increased in the same period from about 0.6 million tons to well over 2 million tons. Nearly all captured wild salmon are Pacific salmon. The capture of wild Atlantic salmon has always been relatively small and has declined steadily since 1990. In 2011 only 2,500 tons were reported. In contrast about half of all farmed salmon are Atlantic salmon. Recreational salmon fishing can be a technically demanding kind of sport fishing, not necessarily congenial for beginning fishermen. A conflict exists between commercial fishermen and recreational fishermen for the right to salmon stock resources. Commercial fishing in estuaries and coastal areas is often restricted so enough salmon can return to their natal rivers where they can spawn and be available for sport fishing. On parts of the North American West Coast, sport salmon fishing completely replaces inshore commercial fishing. The commercial value of a salmon can be several times less than the value of the same fish caught by a sport fisherman. This is a powerful economic argument for allocating stock resources preferential to sport fishing. Salmon aquaculture is a major contributor to the world production of farmed finfish, representing about 10 billion US dollars annually. Other commonly cultured fish species include tilapia, catfish, sea bass, carp, and bream. Salmon farming is significant in Chile, Norway, Scotland, 
Canada and the Faroe Islands, it is the source for most salmon consumed in the United States and Europe. Atlantic salmon are also, in very small volumes, farmed in Russia and Tasmania, Australia. Salmon are carnivorous. They are fed a meal produced from catching other wild fish and other marine organisms. Salmon farming leads to a high demand for wild forage fish. Salmon require large nutritional intakes of protein, and farmed salmon consume more fish than they generate as a final product. On a dry weight basis, 2 to 4 kilograms of wild caught fish are needed to produce 1 kg of salmon. As the salmon farming industry expands, it requires more wild forage fish for feed, at a time when 75% of the world's monitored fisheries are already near to or have exceeded their maximum sustainable yield. The industrial scale extraction of wild forage fish for salmon farming affects the survivability of the wild predator fish which rely on them for food. Work continues on substituting vegetable proteins for animal proteins in the salmon diet. This substitution results in lower levels of a highly valued omega-3 fatty acid content in the farmed product. Intensive salmon farming uses open net cages, which have low production costs. It has the drawback of allowing disease and sea lice to spread to local wild salmon stocks. Another form of salmon production, which is safer but less controllable is to raise salmon in hatcheries until they are old enough to become independent. They are released into rivers in an attempt to increase the salmon population. This system is referred to as ranching. It was very common in countries such as Sweden, before the Norwegians developed salmon farming, but is seldom done by private companies. As anyone may catch the salmon when they return to spawn, a company is limited in benefiting financially from their investment. Because of this, the ranching method has mainly been used by various public authorities and non-profit groups, such as the Cook Inlet Aquaculture Association, as a way to increase salmon populations in situations where they have declined due to over-harvesting, construction of dams, and habitat destruction or fragmentation. Negative consequences to this sort of population manipulation include genetic dilution of the wild stocks. Many jurisdictions are now beginning to discourage supplemental fish planting in favor of harvest controls, and habitat improvement and protection. A variant method of fish stocking, called ocean ranching, is under development in Alaska. There, the young salmon are released into the ocean far from any wild salmon streams. When it is time for them to spawn, they return to where they were released, where fishermen can catch them. An alternative method to hatcheries is to use spawning channels. These are artificial streams, usually parallel to an existing stream, with concrete or riprap sides and gravel bottoms. Water from the adjacent stream is piped into the top of the channel, sometimes via header pond, to settle out sediment. Spawning success is often much better in channels than in adjacent streams due to the control of floods, which in some years can wash out the natural red stop because of the lack of floods. Spawning channels must sometimes be cleaned out to remove accumulated sediment. The same floods that destroy natural reds also clean the regular streams. Spawning channels preserve the natural selection of natural streams, as there is no benefit, as in hatcheries, to use prophylactic chemicals to control diseases. Farm raised salmon are fed the carotenoids astaxanthin and canthaxanthin to match their flesh color to wild salmon to improve their marketability. One proposed alternative to the use of wild-caught fish as feed for the salmon, is the use of soy-based products. This should be better for the local environment of the fish farm, but producing soybeans has a high environmental cost for the producing region. The fish omega-3 fatty acid content would be reduced compared to fish-fed salmon. Another possible alternative is a yeast-based co-product of bioethanol production. Protonaceous fermentation biomass. Substituting such products for engineered feed can result in equal, sometimes enhanced, growth in fish. With its increasing availability, this would address the problems of rising costs for buying hatchery fish feed. Yet another attractive alternative is the increased use of seaweed. Seaweed provides essential minerals and vitamins for growing organisms. It offers the advantage of providing natural amounts of dietary fiber and having a lower glycemic load than grain based fish meal. In the best case scenario, widespread use of seaweed could yield a future in aquaculture that eliminates the need for land, fresh water, or fertilizer to raise fish. The population of wild salmon declined markedly in recent decades especially North Atlantic populations, which spawn in the waters of Western Europe and Eastern Canada, and wild salmon in the Snake and Columbia River systems in northwestern United States. Salmon population levels are of concern in the Atlantic and in some parts of the Pacific. 
Alaska fisheries stocks are still abundant, and catches have been on the rise in recent decades, after the state initiated limitations in 1972. Some of the most important Alaskan salmon sustainable wild fisheries are located near the Kenai River, Copper River, and in Bristol Bay. Fish farming of Pacific salmon is outlawed in the United States' exclusive economic zone, however, there is a substantial network of publicly funded hatcheries, and the state of Alaska's fisheries management system is viewed as a leader in the management of wild fish stocks. In Canada, returning Skeena River wild salmon support commercial, subsistence and recreational fisheries, as well as the area's diverse wildlife on the coast and around communities hundreds of miles inland in the watershed. The status of wild salmon in Washington is mixed out of 435 wild stocks of salmon and steelhead, only 187 of them were classified as healthy, 113 had an unknown status, 1 was extinct, 12 were in critical condition and 122 were experiencing depressed populations. The commercial salmon fisheries in California have been either severely curtailed or closed completely in recent years, due to critically low returns on the Klamath Hand or Sacramento Rivers, causing millions of dollars in losses to commercial fishermen. Both Atlantic and Pacific salmon are popular sport fish. Salmon populations have been established in all the Great Lakes. Coho stocks were planted by the state of Michigan in the late 1960s to control the growing population of non native alewife. Now Chinook, King, Atlantic, and Coho, Silver, salmon are annually stocked in all Great Lakes by most bordering states and provinces. These populations are not self sustaining and do not provide much in the way of a commercial fishery, but have led to the development of a thriving sport fishery. Salmon is a popular food. Classified as an oily fish, salmon is considered to be healthy due to the fish's high protein, high omega 3 fatty acids, and high vitamin D content. Salmon is also a source of cholesterol, with a range of 23 to 214 mg 100 grams depending on the species. According to reports in the journal Science, farmed salmon may contain high levels of dioxins. PCB, polychlorinated biphenyl, levels may be up to eight times shyer in farmed salmon than in wild salmon, but still well below levels considered dangerous. Nonetheless, according to a 2006 study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, the benefits of eating even farmed salmon still outweigh any risks imposed by contaminants. Farmed salmon has a high omega 3 fatty acid content comparable to wild salmon. The type of omega 3 present may not be a factor for other important health functions. Salmon flesh is generally orange to red, although white fleshed wild salmon with white black skin color occurs. The natural color of salmon results from carotenoid pigments, largely astaxanthin, but also canthaxanthin, in the flesh. Wild salmon get these carotenoids from eating krill and other tiny shellfish. The vast majority of Atlantic salmon available around the world are farmed, almost 99%, whereas the majority of Pacific salmon are wild-caught, greater than 80%. Canned salmon in the U.S. is usually wild Pacific catch, though some farmed salmon is available in canned form. Smoked salmon is another popular preparation method, and can either be hot or cold smoked. Lox can refer to either cold smoked salmon or salmon current in a brine solution, also called gravlox. Traditional canned salmon includes some skin, which is harmless, and bone, which adds calcium. Skinless and boneless canned salmon is also available. Raw salmon flesh may contain Anisakis nematodes, marine parasites that cause anisakiasis. Before the availability of refrigeration, the Japanese did not consume raw salmon. Salmon and salmon roe have only recently come into use in making sashimi, raw fish, and sushi. To the indigenous peoples of the Pacific Northwest Coast, salmon is considered a vital part of the diet. Specifically, the indigenous peoples of Haida Gwaii, located near former Queen Charlotte Island in British Columbia, rely on salmon as one of their main sources of food, although many other bands have fished Pacific waters for centuries. Salmon are not only ancient and unique but it is important because it is expressed in culture, art forms, and ceremonial feasts. Annually, salmon spawn in Haida, feeding on everything on the way upstream and down. Within the Haida nation, salmon is referred to as tsien, and is prepared in several ways including smoking, baking, frying, and making soup. Historically, there has always been enough salmon, as people would not overfish, and only took what they needed. In 2003, a report on First Nation participation in commercial fisheries, including salmon, commissioned by BC's Ministry of Agriculture, 
Food and Fisheries found that there were 595 First Nation owned and operated commercial vessels in the province. Of those vessels, First Nations members own 564. However, employment within the industry has decreased overall by 50% in the last decade, with 8,142 registered commercial fishermen in 2003. This has affected employment for many fishermen, who rely on salmon as a source of income. Black bears also rely on salmon as food. The leftovers the bears leave behind are considered important nutrients for the Canadian forest, such as the soil, trees, and plants. In this sense, the salmon feed the forest and in return receive clean water and gravel in which to hatch and grow, sheltered from extremes of temperature and water flow in times of high and low rainfall. However, the condition of the salmon in Haida has been affected in recent decades. Due to logging and development, much of the salmon's habitat, i.e., Ain River, has been destroyed resulting in the fish being close to endangered. For residents, this has resulted in limits on catches, in turn, has affected families' diets, and cultural events such as feasts. Some of the salmon systems in danger include, the Davidan, Nadan, Mamam, and Mathers. It is clear that further protection is needed for salmon, such as their habitats, where logging commonly occurs. The salmon has long been at the heart of the culture and livelihood of coastal dwellers, which can be traced as far back as 5,000 years when archaeologists discovered Nisqually tribe's remnants. The original distribution of the genus Oncorhynchus covered the Pacific Rim coastline. History shows salmon used tributaries, rivers and estuaries without regard to jurisdiction for 18 to 22 million years. Baseline data is near impossible to recreate based on the inconsistent historical data but confirmed there have been massive depletions since 1900s. The Pacific Northwest was once sprawled with native inhabitants who practiced eco-management, to ensure little degradation was caused by their actions to salmon habitats. As animists, the indigenous people relied not only for salmon for food, but spiritual guidance. The role of the salmon spirit guided the people to respect ecological systems such as the rivers and tributaries the salmon used for spawning. Natives often used the entire fish and left no waste by creating items such as turning the bladder into glue, bones for toys, and skin for clothing and shoes. The first salmon ceremony was introduced by indigenous tribes on the Pacific coast, which consists of three major parts. First is the welcoming of the first catch, then comes the cooking, and lastly, the return of the bones to the sea to induce hospitality so that other salmon would guide their lives to the people of that village. Many tribes such as the Yurok had a taboo against harvesting the first fish that swam upriver in summer, but once they confirmed that the salmon had returned in abundance they would begin to catch them in plentiful. The indigenous practices were guided by deep ecological wisdom, which was eradicated when Euro-American settlements began to be developed. Salmon have a much grander history than what is presently shown today. The salmon that once dominated the Pacific Ocean are now just a fraction in population and size. The Pacific salmon population is now less than 1-3% of what it was when Lewis and Clark arrived at the region. In his 1908 State of the Union address, U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt observed that the fisheries were in significant decline. The salmon fisheries of the Columbia River are now but a fraction of what they were 25 years ago and what they would be now if the United States government had taken complete charge of them by intervening between Oregon and Washington. During these 25 years the fishermen of each state have naturally tried to take all they could get, and the two legislatures have never been able to agree on joint action of any kind adequate in degree for the protection of the fisheries. At the moment the fishing on the Oregon side is practically closed, while there is no limit on the Washington side of any kind and no one can tell what the courts will decide as to the very statutes under which this action and non-action result. Meanwhile very few salmon reach the spawning grounds, and probably four years hence the fisheries will amount to nothing, and this comes from a struggle between the associated, or gillnet, fishermen on the one hand, and the owners of the fishing wheels up the river. On the Columbia River the Chief Joseph Dam completed in 1955 completely blocks salmon migration to the upper Columbia River system. The Fraser River salmon population was affected by the 1914 slide caused by the Canadian Pacific Railway at Hell's Gate. The 1917 catch was one quarter of the 1913 catch. The salmon is an important creature in several strands of Celtic mythology and poetry, which often associated them with wisdom and venerability. In Irish mythology, a creature called the salmon of knowledge plays key role in the tale The Boyhood Deeds of Fionn. In the tale, the salmon will grant powers of knowledge to whoever eats it and is sought by poet Phineas for seven years. Finally Phineas catches the fish and gives it to his young pupil, Fionn MacCool, 
to prepare it for him. However, Fionn burns his thumb on the salmon's juices, and he instinctively puts it in his mouth. In so doing, he inadvertently gains the salmon's wisdom. Elsewhere in Irish mythology, the salmon is also one of the incarnations of both Tone Mac Carroll and Fintan Mac Bacra. Salmon also feature in Welsh mythology. In the prose tale Cullhook and Alwe, the salmon of Lin Liu is the oldest animal in Britain, and the only creature who knows the location of Mabon at Modron. After speaking to a string of other ancient animals who do not know his whereabouts, King Arthur's men Kai and Bedwyr are led to the salmon of Lin Liu, who lets them ride its back to the walls of Mabon's prison in Gloucester. In Norse mythology, after Loki tricked the blind god Hothra into killing his brother Balder, Loki jumped into a river and transformed himself into a salmon to escape punishment from the other gods. When they held out a net to trap him he attempted to leap over it but was caught by Thor who grabbed him by the tail with his hand, and this is why the salmon's tail is tapered. Salmon are central spiritually and culturally to Native American mythology on the Pacific coast, from the Haida and Coast Salish peoples, to the Nichonal peoples in British Columbia. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.